Hello everybody. Um, Avi is at Princeton celebrating the 100th anniversary of some random theory or other. <laughs> <laughs> but we actually have a very interesting uh, program ahead of us. Uh, we'll be start. We'll be led off by um, Ilsa Cleves um, of the ITC, protoplanet hunting with almond observation of molecular lines. Should be followed by Benedict Diener, who's going to talk about the, uh, the splashback radius, physical boundary of dark matter halos. Then Catherine Walsh, who is the uh, colloquium speaker this morning uh, for a mic, will talk about Alma, reveals the anatomy of the millimeter sized dust and electric gas in the HD 970485. And then this will be rounded off by Anna Pankos, also of the IPC, revealing the hidden borderline region in ATM. So, also, you're on. Thank you. Um, hi, everyone. I'm Nilsa, and today I hope to convince you that one of the very best ways to look for and characterize the very youngest exoplanets is by looking at signatures in the molecular gas of their parent circumstellar disks. And this is with, within the current capabilities of the Atacama Large Millimeter Array, or ALMA. Now, one of the most fundamental and biggest questions in disk science is how do we actually go about converting this gas, ice, and dust into the myriad of planetary systems we see today, including our own? Now, there are a couple of competing theories, or leading theories, namely core accretion or gravitational instability. They have very different timescales involved. They require very different mass distributions in the gas and in the solids. They have different dependencies on the metallicity of the host star. So to really start to test these various theories, we would like to start observing the process in situ. Now, at least until very recently, the state of the art was looking at structures and disks at tens of AU in scale. So this was commensurate with transition disks, which are just large inner clearings um, in their innermost regions, and they're thought to be cleared out possibly by multi-planet systems. But of course, this is already a fairly evolved state of affairs. We'd like to go further, even uh, further back in time to the formation of, of the gas giants themselves at physics on AU or sub-AU scales. And of course, I'd be remiss if I didn't show the beautiful image of HL Tau, which you've already seen once today at the ITC colloquium, uh, where the beam at the, in band six was about four AU, so we're almost there in, in the continuum. And as I was putting together this talk, I realized that this image, the press release, uh, came out exactly one year ago tomorrow. So uh, the one year anniversary of HL Tau, or the 10 to the 5 anniversary, really. Uh, and so we'd like to start actually characterizing planet formation happening in disks in situ. So what happens when you put a planet in a disk? In this uh, nice movie, you have a 30 Earth mass compa companion embedded in this, circum this gas-rich circumstellar disk. And over time, it will clear out material along its orbit, uh, so it's forming a gap here. And you can see the circumplanetary disk, which is funneling the accretion of, of gas and dust uh, from the parent circumstellar disk onto the planet. Now, about 10 years ago, uh, Sebastian Wolf uh, pointed out that this accretion luminosity, this, this extra heating due to the release of the gravitational accretional energy uh, from the material falling onto the planet, can substantially heat up the local environment near the planet. And they found that um, this would greatly enhance our ability to detect very young protoplanets in the continuum with ALMA. And these are simulations for planets at 50 parsec, planets embedded in disks at 50 parsec and 100 parsec. And this is just assuming sort of typical values that the planet is accreting at the same rate that the disk accretes onto the star and so forth. And you get accretion luminosities of sort of 10 to the minus three uh, solar luminosities um, in, in magnitude. So this got us thinking. Do, does this heating signature of these self-luminous planets do they induce distinct chemical signatures on the background circumstellar disk? Now you might ask, well, why, would we, why do we want to go to the gas? Well, now you open up the entire spectral dimension, so you can get kinematic information of the velocities near the planet, potentially, and you can also get temperatures through line ratios, for example. So uh, how do we simulate this? Well, this, sort of over, this, this model is a little too complicated, so we just put down a power law uh, for now. And so this is a power law density structure we cut open a gap that's hill radius in size for a Jupiter mass planet, and then we put in two heating sources. You have the central star, but then you add a second heating source due to the planet with typical uh, accretion luminosity corresponding to a, about an effective temperature of 1500 Kelvin, which is uh, sort of commensurate with what we see for the embedded uh, protoplanets and young disks. 
Now, what's the expected chemical behavior? Well, the disk is broadly volatile ice rich. And uh, if this planet is sufficiently hot, you might be able to sublimate ices uh, locally in the environment near the planet. And so now you're turning this ice into the gas phase where it's possibly detectable in the submillimeter. So how we actually simulate it is using the radio transfer capabilities of the code torus. So in the center, this yellow saturated area is where the star is, which I've stretched so that you can actually see the heating contribution due to the planet offset here on the lower right. We explore planets at different locations in the disk, so different uh, uh, 5 AU through 30 AU. And the reason for this is that there's an overall temperature gradient in the disk. It's warmer closer in, colder further out. And so where you put a planet in the disk will determine which ices are available to be sublimated. So if you compare that to uh, very common snow lines, um, each, each planet that sits behind each snow line can possibly evaporate that particular ice. And that's just in the midplane. We do have the vertical structure of the, the, the temperature, so it's a full three-dimensional model here. But that does pose one particular problem, namely that most of our modeling architecture that's been developed at the University of Michigan to simulate the chemistry of disks is, is in 2D. And so to help, help uh, put the 3D model into the 2D box, we had to cut up this model into slices, so we finally sampled the area near the planet. And then we have a slice away from the planet, which I call the anti-planet side. And to ice, so we want to look for the most strongly affected molecules, and we want to do this in an unbiased way. And so we directly compare the planet to the, the planet to the anti-planet side um, to look for the str most strongly affected abundances of gas phase species. And so here are some of the results um, where I'm plotting column density on the y-axis and distance from the star on the x-axis. And so the pink is the planet and the teal is anti-planet. And so many of the species are in fact enhanced due to the planet's extra heating. But there are some oddballs here. There's methane and CS that are weirdly low. And so I'll come back to those later. And the three-dimensional abundance structure looks something like this, um, where this is the midplane, um, and it's an azimuth around the, the star in the center, and then the vertical structure of the, the local chemistry. But this is all, these are chemical abundances. What does this mean for observability? We've created um, ALMA predictions to test this, and so these are full ALMA simulations that uh, we calculate the emergent line intensity, assuming a density and a temperature structure. Uh, we've added noise, and uh, in all cases, for these lines of HCN and H13CN, uh, we're, able to, uh, we're able to recover the emission due to the planet um, for these rotational transitions of 8 to 7 and 4 to 3. And so this means we can do line ratio science, so we can get temperatures, we can get opacities by comparing the H13CN to HCN brightness, so we can start to characterize physical environment, uh, local physical environments. Now there's a few things that I've kind of swept under the rug in the first half of the talk, uh, namely uh, the rotation of the disk and also whether uh, the, the assumption that the planet is uniformly accreting so rotation is important. So for the most part, uh, our simplifications were OK. So the radiative equilibrium times are extremely rapid compared to the orbital time. So what that means is that the dust temperature structure will follow the planet along in its orbit. Similarly, the freeze out and thermal desorption um, together are also extremely rapid compared to the orbital time. And so we expect the ices to only sublimate near the planet, and then when the planet moves ahead, they'll freeze back out. And so that should um, follow the planet and also allow for repeat observability. Now, um, these two oddball species, we looked at them um, more closely and noticed that they are being affected by gradual gas phase chemistry, and so they are being slowly processed. And so this assumption of fast timescales breaks down when you're trying to predict these uh, particular molecular abundances. And so we're now taking this into account. And so the first, the first paper was about how, what happens on the, the short time scales. What is the local chemistry to the, due to the planet? But now we're adding rotation, where we're moving now into the rest frame of the gas parcel, and we're allowing it to be periodically heated as it crosses orbits with the planet, uh, set by the differential rotation um, in the disk. So uh, what do we see? Um, so for the first case, when the, t the chemical species is destroyed rel relatively rapidly compared to the orbital time, that species should follow the planet. So this is, again, the ice, the freeze out, and thermal desorption case. And so in the rest frame of the gas parcel, it will only, its 
chemical abundance will only be altered when it's in line with the planet. In the case where your destruction time is a little bit longer uh, compared to the orbital time scale, you're gonna, you're, you can produce that species relatively rapidly, but then it might take a while for it to be destroyed and to, to fall off and to disappear, and so you might end up with a sawtooth abundance pattern in the disk. And finally, um, for the case where it's, the destruction time is extremely long, the planet will start lapping the gas parcel, and so it'll never be able to adjust back to the background steady state chemical abundances of the disk. And so you can paint on chemical rings, possibly due to um, the heating of the planet. So we're simulating this now. These are all preliminary results. Uh, so we start off by calculating the chemistry of the background disk uh, for 0.1 mega years. Then we inject a planet and basically turn on these temperature perturbations and examine the structure that comes out. Do we see rings? Do we see these chemical arms? And so here I'll be showing a quick movie. Um, these are all these are radial distances from the star. This is time. So this is 5,000 years or a few hundred orbits for a planet at 10 AU, which is indicated by the dashed line. And I'll show the change in the, uh, the column density due, uh, due to the planet. And so for HDN, our first simple tracer, we do see the spiky structure. So HDN seems to only change in its abundance when the planet and the gas are aligned, and so it should follow the planet um, as we predicted in the first paper. But remember, CS was an oddball. OCS has two, and so you start to see uh, interesting structure where this is sawtooth pattern. So gas-based chemistry is at work here, and so it requires these more detailed simulations. And we'll also be adding in non-uniform accretion, so we'll start off with an initially hotter planet that cools off as it's accreting more slowly and uh, has less of a gas reservoir to accrete from over time. And so since I'm out of time, I'll leave my summary up here and take questions. Thank you. So if the dust is optically thick, it would hide the signature of the planet. So if the, if the dust opacity surface is above the, the planet's um, region. But if, if there is a nice kind of sweet spot, actually. So if you have a little bit of additional dust in the gaps, you're able to trap more of the uh, radiation from the planet. And so then it gets redistributed isotropically and sends some of that radiation that was about to leave the gap back into the disk and so can actually enhance the signature. But that's only if you're in the case where you had just a little bit of extra dust, but not so much dust that it's optically thick. Yes. No, unfortunately not, because, I mean, so that's like the amount of mass that can, like, if, if you neglect accretion or a gas movement through that annulus, like that's the amount of gas that's available to that planet within a hill radius distance, radial distance, but there you can also get additional mass from the accretion of the disk that can add to that planet's that uh, bulk mass. So I've only assumed a Jupiter mass planet in all of these cases, but that is something we can look at. So Alma has pretty high resolution uh, capabilities, as we saw with HL Tau. So you don't have to see it go all the way around, but you could possibly see it go a little bit further and a little bit further, and maybe draw an orbit that way. I'm not actually sure I need a microphone because I have a very loud voice. Can you hear me? Or? Okay, fine. <laughs>
Well, I hope I won't blow your ears out, you know. Um, how do I use the, is, is the pointer? Is the pointer? No, just leave the pointer. Sweet. All right. Hi, I'm Benedict. For those who I haven't met yet, I want to tell you about um, a really exciting sort of serendipitous finding that we had in some n-body simulations. Now, you've all seen images like this, the cosmic web of dark matter filaments. And to me, one of the most important predictions of these simulations is that dark matter clumps into these balls that we call halos. Now, when you look at a density field like this, it's actually not so obvious to me where the halos end. I mean, I think you can all pinpoint where they lie, but where do they end? Where does the cosmic web begin? Now, the classical answer, of course, is the virial radius, right? I've marked it in these red circles here. But when you look back at the density field, it's not so obvious, right? So the question I want to ask today is, where is the edge of a halo? Or maybe more succinctly even, is there an edge to a halo? Now, you might be saying, what's this guy been smoking, right? We all know since the late 90s that halos are NFW profiles, so... Density versus radius goes something as power law, slope of minus one in the center, and then a power law with a slope of minus three in the outside, and that's obviously sort of scale-free, right? So no edge. And then you can you know, use the variable radius, some over-density radius, which is supposed to have some physical meaning, but it's actually a bit questionable. But it turns out that the real universe is not that simple. So let's look at some of the density profiles in my simulations. So what I'm showing you are median density profiles and scatter of two samples, one of very small galaxy halos and one of very massive clusters. Now your eye is drawn to this sort of big scatter out here. That's just because small halos feel their environment very strongly. But what I want to point your attention to is the fact that these two profiles really don't quite look the same, right? You can see that better if we look at the slope profile. So let me plot d log rho over d log r. The dot dashed line is the NFW fit, so that sort of slowly approaches the slope of minus 3. And we see that these little guys, they kind of follow it. I mean, they get steeper, and then around here on the very radius, the environment kicks in, and the NFW profile is not supposed to describe that. But what about the big guys? So there the profile sort of steepens around half a variable radius and gets very, very steep to a slope of minus 4, which really isn't expected at any radius. What's going on here? Well, it turns out that these halos are not, they don't have this steep sort of edgy feature because they're big. It's because they have a high mass accretion rate. So here I'm again showing you profiles, but this time it's multiplied by R squared so that we can compress the range a bit. And they're all of the same mass, but of different mass accretion rates, which I've called gamma. And the dark blue lines, the high gamma, fast accreting halos, they have this really steep profile out here, whereas the slowly accreting halos that sort of just sit there, they look more like NFW profiles. And you can also see that where the steepest slope occurs depends on the mass accretion rate as well. So, whoa, 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 right? Crazy. I, you know, these are things that I bet a lot of you have never heard before, right? So, like, halo density profiles depend on mass accretion rate, and where's all this coming from? So to see why this is, we got to take a bit of a time trip to the 80s when omega m was 1 and everything was good. So let's imagine a universe where omega m is 1 and it's infinite. There is one tiny perturbation in it. We imagine the dark matter around this perturbation to be in shells that are initially expanding with the Hubble flow. And then at some radius that we call the turnaround radius, the excess gravity from this perturbation is going to start pulling these shells inwards. More and more shells are going to be created, the perturbation grows, the turnaround radius grows. Then because dark matter is collisionless, the shells go through the center and don't collide, but they just come back out and they start oscillating in this potential. That's the picture. Now what this model predicts um, is some sort of scale-free profile, and then it has this outer edge where the outermost shell that's falling in sits. And what's interesting about this is that that's a physically motivated halo radius, right? Because Inside this shell, the matter is really going back and forth in and out of the potential, but outside of that shell, all the matter is in the first infall. So that's sort of you know, what you'd want to call a halo edge. Now, this was predicted in the 80s, but let's see. I mean, we all know this isn't very realistic, right? So if you look at real halo collapse, nothing is spherical. They merge like crazy, so they're not isolated. Omega m, of course, is not one. And from this, you immediately see that you have little hope. But 
the one thing we can take away from this model is this idea that matter falls in and then comes back out to sort of this, this radius that is determined by its infall energy. And you'll see that in, in a second in the movie I pointed out to you. You see this shell coming out right here? That's what we call splashback. And the radius to which this comes out is what we call the splashback radius. And today I'm arguing that that is really the halo radius you should consider. So again, particles fall in, right? They go to the upper center of their first orbit. They linger there because that's where they're slowest. Now this explains a few things. This immediately explains why the steepening feature, which is really the splashback radius, was sharpest for fast accreting halos. That's just because in those halos there are more particles on their first orbit to demarcate this line. It also explains why this radius will be smaller for fast accreting halos because in those halos the gravitational potential has grown while the particle is on its first orbit so it can't come out quite as far anymore. So now let's see how this all works out um, for uh, individual halos. So here I'm showing you just a slice in density through a halo. Solid line is good old classical virial radius, doesn't really correspond to a particular feature in the density profile at all. The dot dashed line is R200 mean, that's better, but still not good, and the splashback radius is this dashed line. And I didn't just draw that in by hand, that's actually from a calibration we did. And so this is a slowly accreting halo, so for a fast accreting halo, we get this picture where the splashback radius here is actually slightly smaller than R200 mean. Right? And so this was basically the point of our 2015 paper. So we calibrated this and we found that sort of our splashback is, you know, close-ish to R200 mean and the relation depends, interestingly, on the mass accretion rate as we saw. And then there is a secondary dependence on redshift. It doesn't depend on mass, which is very cool, I think. So it's kind of self-similar in that way, right? And it doesn't matter if you're a huge cluster or a small halo, you'll have the same relation, more or less. Now, if we accept this picture where the splashback radius really delineates a halo, then this has immediate consequences, right? So first, we think about the halo history differently, like the mass accretion history, and that's an important input to galaxy formation models. There are some other really fun consequences like this one. You could ask, do the Milky Way and Andromeda halos overlap? And I think the classical picture is definitely no. I mean, you can use different mass estimates and so on, but it doesn't really matter. The virial radii don't overlap. I don't think anybody would disagree with that. But the splashback radii I almost certainly do. So I don't know the mass accretion rate of these two halos, of course. So I can only use some sort of average. But it doesn't really matter. I think it's, it's pretty, pretty clear that they overlap. And so this is sort of a different picture of the local group almost. Now, you might say this is all simulation stuff, right? You know, I'm sure some of you don't believe a word of what I've said. So let me uh, show you some observations. Now, fundamentally, this is of course, hard to observe the steepening or the splashback radius just because it's at large radii, right? I mean, anything we observe gets harder and then you go way beyond the virial radius. So it's not easy, but some brave people such as locals, Anna Pate and Avi have already gone out and tried this. So they used individual clusters from SDSS and just sort of counted the surface density of cluster members. And what they found and then they were looking for sort of statistically significant evidence of a profile with sort of the density jump, this purple line, uh, over a, just say an NFW profile. And these are the eight clusters for which they found the strongest evidence. So this is not an unbiased sample. Uh, I think it's actually this one has the strongest one about 1689. There it's really quite clear that the NFW profile is a pretty poor fit. Um, and then there are a lot of other clusters where there's sort of no evidence either way, really. It's just too noisy. So I would say this is very cool, but it's not a slam dunk, you know, I've convinced you all that the splashback radius is real. But I think this data set might do it. So this is the project that we're working on right now. We're looking again at member galaxies in clusters. So again, you just plot the surface density profile of members. But this time we're not looking at individual clusters, we're stacking. <laughs> SDSS clusters in particular. And that is not easy because you have to make sure, you have to convince yourself that you're really choosing clusters of a particular mass, so you need weak lensing. The way you do the stacking and so on really matters, so this is hard. And Suhud Moga really has been, been doing all this very, very hard work. But then you have enormous statistical power, of course, because you're looking at so many galaxies. And so you can split the sample 
And of course, we want to split it by accretion rate, right? We want to split it by um, how fast galaxies are accreting. And this is um, hard to do again. I don't have time to go into it. So just trust me that the, the dark blue line, that is the observed profile of members in fast accreting clusters, whereas the light blue line is slowly accreting clusters. And this is R200 mean. Now we can fit this with basically the formula that we came up with in 2014. Fits very well. I think one thing that's very, very clear is there is a steepening, right? You can see this drop in density, in surface density in this case. And then, even more excitingly from that, we can infer the 3D density profile that these 2D densities would correspond to. That would be even way steeper, like basically exactly like the things I showed you earlier. And then we define again the splashback radius as the point where the profile is steepest. And that I've marked with these dotted lines. And we see that it goes in exactly the right direction, right? So the fast accreting clusters, they have the smaller splashback radius compared to the slower accreting clusters. Now, if you've paid attention, you might have noticed that they're both lower than R200 mean. So that's a little bit different from our simulations. And we're still working on understanding why that is. Anyway, um, I'm very excited about this result, I think. At least I'm convinced by this. Paper should be out in a few months, hopefully. So all I want you to take away today is that there is such a thing as an edge to a halo, and it's a physically motivated definition, this splashback radius. And it's been observed. Thanks. So your observational evidence was just based on counting galaxies, right? Yeah. Can weak lensing directly tell you what the dark matter is doing? Uh, I wish it could. I wish it could. No, it's unfortunately just at such large radii that your weak lensing signal really craps out. So even if you look at the best surveys like CLASH, they get really crappy already around our 500, and then we need to go away further. So, so. Your cluster, the ABLE 1689, I think it's got weak lensing data, right? But I'm sure it, it does, does but not that far out. Man. I mean... You know, maybe we might get there one day. I still haven't actually convincingly heard from anyone that it's not possible on fundamental grounds. It's just the over-density at which the splashback radius sits is already sort of 10 or something, right, over background. So, you know, your lensing just gets really weak. Right. That would be the direct measure because your, yeah. your prediction is for the dark matter. That's right. Right? That's right. So everything I've shown you, I should have said this more clearly, is sort of predicated on the subhalos following the, the general dark matter density profile. But when you looked at that video, that's not crazy because the subhalos also just splash out to the same splashback radius. So. You know the redshift to the observed clusters, you can potentially make predictions on their accretion history since that's the only other parameter that your model depends on for the splashback radius. Right. So... The problem is that the scatterer in the mass accretion rates is very, very large. So for any, even you can put an average on it, but for any individual halo, cluster or not, we just don't know. It's like the same with the Milky Way, you know, it could be rapidly accreting, we wouldn't know. It could be completely quiescent. You might want to use something other than n-body simulations. That's right, I'm thinking about doing this in, you know, something like Illustrious. Yeah. Yeah, a little bit. Um, sort of exactly this idea, right? If you had a quench fraction, would you see it, a sharp drop around it? And I think it's worth exploring. Um, my gut feeling is it would be difficult because when you think about the orbit, right? So you're talking about a relatively short time between the splashback radius and the virial radius. And so that's what you're trying to tell apart, right? I think you might have a hard time convincing anyone that you know well enough how galaxies quench, for example, right? Because I'd have to convince you of some sort of quenching model first, right? Oh, but you spend a lot of time out at that at epicenter. A lot of things hang out at the edge of their orbit. Yes, but then you've already gone through the center once. So how do I know? You'd have to catch them on first infall, right? When they first fall through the splashback radius and then fall through the very radius. Oh, are you saying you'd wait until they come out again? Yeah. Oh, okay. That's an interesting idea. I'd have to think about that. The problem is if all the quenching happens at the center, 
and you're kind of toast, right? But it's, you know, it's a good idea. <coughs> Yeah, so the, um, you're right, so what you, the splashback radius shows up as a zero velocity surface, right? You, you come to rest and then you fall back. Unfortunately, that happens on the background of strong infall with very negative velocities. So if you just take the average radial profile, it doesn't really show up. Yeah. Um, in observations, if you know a tracer that can do this, I really would like to hear about it. <laughs> Right now it is. Um, X-rays are getting exciting, I think. So it's, again, it's a radius question, right? So they get really weak out there. But there is one cluster for which I believe um, Alexei Viglinin has some unpublished data, which there's a tiny hint of something maybe. It's going to be hard, but I think it's doable with future generation X-ray telescopes. But you just, I think you're just photon limited, right? I mean, you just, the counts are just very, very low out there. You can hear me okay? That's not mine. There we go. Good stuff. Uh, so thanks very much for giving me the opportunity to tell you a little bit about uh, quite a small project I've been working on, um, which is uh, parallel to my hat as an astrochemist. So usually I work in molecular astrophysics, but now that we're in the era of ALMA, I've had to put my observer's hat on a little bit, and my observer's hat has novice written on, on the front of it. But I'm learning a lot. It's a steep learning curve, but it's also very interesting. So yes, I'm going to tell you a story uh, about uh, ALMA observations of the disk around this interesting object, HD97048. Um, so HD97048 is a Herbig AEB star. It has an effective temperature of around 10,000 Kelvin. And as I'll show a little bit later, it is known to host a protoplanetary disk that's quite extensive, around 700 AU in radius, imaged in scattered light. Um, so protoplanetary disks around Herbig stars actually come in, in two different flavors. And this was originally proposed some years ago uh, via spectral energy distribution measurements and then subsequent modeling that uh, the group one type disks around Herbig AE stars were actually flared in nature. So they capture a lot of UV from the parent star that expands their atmosphere, so they become very flared. And then there's a second uh, group, group two, which are generally flat in nature, with perhaps a puffed up inner rim very close to the star that then shields the outer disk from the uh, stellar radiation and then impedes this uh, flaring. And there's also some um, work done at that time as well to show that these group one or flared protoplanetary disks tend to be very molecule poor um, and they tend to only have very uh, abundant species such as CO and that's again related to this absorption of UV radiation uh, which tends to photo dissociate and um, uh, destroy molecules whether, whereas the flat disk are more molecule rich, they're cold, they're better shielded and you can get molecules forming both in the gas and on the ice. And originally, this was proposed that this was an evolutionary scenario. So you start off with a primordial flared disk, and then a combination of dust grain, growth, and settling leads to the group two or flat disks. And just to show here that in the SED modeling done uh, with ISO predominantly, so the Infrared Space Observatory had very good uh, spectral resolution, the uh, flare disks were inferred from this bump in the mid-infrared, which is not seen in the group two disks. 
So 97048 is a GRIP-1 disk recently proposed as a transition disk via mid-infrared imaging, and they also give us a nice uh, introduction to transition disks. They're disks with a, a large inner gap in the dust and potentially also the gas. And this is a nice Vizier image uh, at 8.6 microns of this source, showing so the position angle of the disk is at zero degrees, so it's more or less inclined uh, towards the uh, north-south axis. And you can see this extension towards the east, which is the um, originates from the flared surface. Um, and then some mid-infrared imaging done in the Q-band more recently infers a gap in this uh, disk of around 34 AU. And these gaps from the mid-infrared observations can be corroborated by spatially resolved imaging at sub-millimeter wavelengths. So I got some Alma Cycle Zero data on 97048 as part of a program to look for chemistry in Herbig AEB AEBE disks. Fortunately, we didn't see much chemistry, but we did see some interesting dust structure. So here I show the continuum of the disk imaged at uh, 346 gigahertz. Uh, so the position angle of the disk is here, and this is the minor axis of the beam, which is probing the highest spatial scales. And you can see that in the inner region, the continuum emission is picking off source. So the source is here at the little cross. And if we take a slice through the continuum, um, both across the disk major axis and the beam minor axis, we can see that we do have a dip at the source position. Uh, so this data actually confirms that this disk is a transition disk, and the gap that we derive from uh, this data is around 25 AU in radius, which is just about on the cusp of the resolution that we have uh, with this data. Uh, modeling of the continuum mission also showed that a simple power law model actually doesn't do a very good job at modeling the dust distribution in this disk. We actually need something more like a a uh, broken power law model where we have something more shallower in the inner region and something very, very steep in the outer region. So the, the emission really falls off very quickly uh, over a few hundred AU. And this picture is actually very consistent with the concept of radial drift. So if we compare the continuum that we get, which is this grey contour here, the continuum goes to about two arc seconds in radius, whereas if we look at the molecular gas traced in the CO3 to 2 transition, it goes to about four arc seconds in radius. So this sharp drop in the millimeter sized dust at around uh, two arc seconds is consistent with the concept of radial drift. So as dust grains grow, coagulate in the outer disk, they become decoupled from the gas. The gas is moving slightly subcaplarian, so the dust grains feel a headwind and they want to move inwards to conserve angular momentum. Okay, so back to the gas. The reason that the gas has this funny morphology, so this is the integrated intensity, uh, is because the, this, this source actually sits very close to a molecular cloud, the chameleon one molecular cloud, and it looks like we have uh, some element of foreground absorption by material sitting in front of the source. So that's why it has this funny uh, dumbbell morphology. So we're missing emission essentially at zero velocity. The other thing that the, the gas can tell us is uh, if we go back to here, we see this nice flared structure in the, in the, in the infrared. Uh, the channel maps of the CO emission actually also show a very nice flared structure. So this is the channel maps. I have mirrored both the negative and positive cha channel maps in the same velocity. And you can see that with the gray contour here, this is if we would have a very f a flat, geometrically flat disk, whereas we're seeing the contours offset by about a projected angle of 10, 20 degrees or so, and that's actually a real flaring angle of about 30 degrees. So this is the, the angle of the CO emitting surface, uh, which is lying at an angle slightly below that from the uh, small dust grains which are creating this image here. Okay, so back to this uh, classification of Herbig AEBE disks. So again, the GRIP-1 disks were thought to be uh, or the flared primordial disks, and we have this evolution to the group two uh, flat and shielded disks. Uh, this is now a little bit less obvious, and the uh, the the uh, what do you call it? The evolutionary pathway uh, now is proposed something more like this. So you start off with something that's a primordial flared disk, and then you move to a group one disk with a gap, which is dependent upon the creation of this gap early in the disk lifetime, or you move to this GRIP2 type disk where you do not have the creation of the gap. 
And the, the origin of the gaps in these disks is, is under some debate. So one of the origins is potentially planets forming early on in, in, the, in the disk lifetime. There's also photo evaporation can play a role at clearing the inner regions of disks um, as well as uh, dead zones. So just some uh, general uh, conclusions. So this data shows that um, uh, HD, HD 97048 is a transitional disk. Uh, we do need higher spatial resolution data to really determine the depth of the gap in the inner disk, and from that we can infer the origin of the gap. The large millimetre-sized dust grains are more centrally concentrated than the molecular gas, so this is uh, evidence of both advanced dust evolution and potentially radial drift of the large dust grains from the outer disk inwards. The molecular disk extends to the same radius as the scattered light images, so whenever these images were taken, there was some speculation at the time because this source is very close to the chameleon one molecular cloud, that it was actually a very young source, so that the scattered light could actually be coming from a remnant uh, molecular envelope. But we can show now that it's not a remnant envelope, it is actually uh, a disk that's extending out to about 700 AU in radius. And the picture of this uh, GRIP1 and GRIP2 Herbig AEBE disks is now moving from this evolution from GRIP1 to GRIP2 following dust evolution, to evolution following a common ancestor, where the GRIP1 disks uh, evolved dependent upon the creation of an inner cavity early in the disk lifetime. And I'll finish there. Thank you. How do you resolve the temperature density ambiguity? To, um... I don't. So all I'm fitting here, because that's it's absolutely true, so if you want to derive both the surface density and the temperature of the disk, you need observations at multiple wavelengths. So we only have 346 gigahertz here, so I am just simply fitting the intensity profile. Uh, and the, the, the power, index, power law indexes that we get here are consistent with what you see for, for protoplanetary disks. So I'm wrapping up all of the information we don't know about the surface density and temperature into this intensity profile. Do you have enough information to estimate what proportion of disks evolved in group one and which what proportion evolved in group two? So the, the statistics are still quite small, actually. Um, so I, th I think, if I'm remembering correctly, in the few tens of sources where this has been done, I, th I think the, it's about 50-50, actually. So we know at least as many GRIP2 disks as we have GRIP1 group, group disks. But the, but the numbers are small, unfortunately. Uh, this is where sur surveys with ALMA would, be, would actually be very good. Very basic question. A yes. couple of slides, you pointed the image and said, ah, you see, this is a flared disk. What should I look for? <laughs> so, okay. So, What's the geometry? Right. So the, yeah, so the position angle of the disk yeah. is more or less aligned north to south, right? So if you imagine that you had a flat disk, it would look circular, right? Uh, now, this disk is inclined by about 40 degrees. So actually it looks like an ellipse. If you had a flat disk, it looks like an ellipse. If you have a flared surface, um, so the disk is flat, it's aligned like this, and then it's flared. So you get an extension and emission towards the east. On the far side. Yes. So the near side, so the near side is projection is much smaller than the far side. Thank you. And then we can actually see it in the channel maps here. So a flat disk would look like this, but we can see that our, our contours, our velocity contours, are shifted. It's tilted that way. Yeah, so you can imagine this like a cone. Good. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. 
All right, hello everyone. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here today and tell you about the work I've been doing trying to measure the masses of supermassive black holes in active galactic nuclei, or AGN. Um, and really, the subject of my talk today is going to be on one of the biggest problems we have in doing this, and how we can solve this problem by constraining the properties of gas close to the black hole in the broadline region. This is work I've been doing with Brendan Brewer and Tommaso Treu and the LAMP 2008 collaboration. Now, the motivation really comes down to the fact that if we want to understand the evolution of supermassive black holes over cosmic time, there are accretion rates and their interaction and possible feedback with the host galaxy, then we need a method for measuring their masses outside of the local universe. This means we need a method that does not depend upon spatially resolving the motions of gas or stars around the black hole. Thankfully, in actively accreting supermassive black holes in AGN, we are able to actually substitute time resolution for spatial resolution and still resolve motions of the broadline region deep within the black hole's gravitational potential. So the broadline region is located here, outside of the AGN accretion disk, but inside the obscuring dusty torus. So this obscures our line of sight to this region from certain angles. And the gas in this region is moving so quickly that emission lines from it are actually broadened. And this is very important because it gives us an actual handle on the kinematics of the gas in this region. So now if we want to measure a black hole mass, the other piece of information we need is to know how far away this gas is from the black hole. So we need to know the size of the broadline region. And to do this, we use reverberation mapping. Reverberation mapping depends upon the stochastic AGN variability of the uh, continuum emission from the accretion disk, which we can observe. But this emission also propagates out to the broadline region where it's reprocessed into broadline flux. So if you monitor an AGN in the continuum emission from the accretion disk and the broadline flux, you'll see the same variability features, but with a time lag tau that depends upon this extra light travel time out to the broadline region. So in order to measure a black hole mass, we simply combine the width of the broad emission line profile with this time lag from reverberation mapping multiply it by c, the speed of light, divide by the gravitational constant, and finally normalize the black hole mass by a dimensionless constant of order unity called f. And this encapsulates all of the unknown details about the geometry, dynamics, and orientation of the broadline region with respect to us. And unfortunately, this value of f and determining it is one of the biggest challenges we face in reverberation mapping because we can't simply spatially resolve the broadline region to figure out what's actually going on. And so in practice, what we do is we measure an average value of f for the entire reverberation map sample. And we use the m sigma relation to do this, this relationship between the black hole mass and the stellar velocity dispersion of the host galaxy bulge. So here in red points are local black holes with gas or star dynamical measurements um, for the mass. And in blue are the reverberation mapped AGNs. So if we assume that they lie in the same relationship, we can get an average value of f. But this adds an uncertainty of up to 0.4 dex, or a factor of 2.5, to individual reverberation mapped masses. This is substantial. Um, and we really should be able to do better than this. So in order to do that, though, I think really the key is to reveal the properties of the hidden broadline region. And the way we've gone about doing this is by trying to model reverberation mapping data directly, because this gives us a handle on three interrelated things. The first is direct constraints on the geometry and dynamics of this hidden broadline region. And this allows us to actually measure the value of f in individual AGN. It also allows us to measure the black hole mass independently of this average value of f, which means we have some hope of measuring it to less than 0.4 dex uncertainty. So the way we've gone about testing this new method is by developing a simply parameterized phenomenological model for the broadline region, where we're just focused on trying to recover the distribution of emission from this region. And we model it using a number of point particles. And each point particle is just going to act like a mirror, reflecting the AGN continuum flux from the accretion disk at the origin to the observer with some time lag that depends on the point particle's position and some wavelength shift in the emitted line flux that depends upon the point particle's velocity. Of course, in order to actually you know, put this model together, it has a couple of parts. The first is that we need to model the AGN continuum light curve so that we can um, evaluate the continuum flux at arbitrary times. And for this, we use Gaussian processes, since this has been found to be a very good model for AGN variability on these timescales. 
and it allows us to incorporate the uncertainty in the interpolation into our final inference on the black hole mass. So here I'm showing you an example of this. The black points are the data, and the brightly colored lines are different examples of the continuum white curve model. Then the second part is an actual model for the geometry and dynamics of the Braubein region, since we need to know how to assign positions and velocities to all of these point particles. And here's an example of this. You can see the edge-on view and the face-on view of a point particle distribution. And finally, we can take this continuum light curve, filter it through this distribution of point particles, and actually make model broad emission line profiles that could be compared directly to data um, as a function of time. So this is what we're actually going to be doing. So the broad line region model that we use is aimed at being mainly very flexible. So for the radial distribution of emission, we use a gamma distribution which can range from a narrow Gaussian to an exponential profile or even steeper. And then we have an opening angle so that we can go from a sphere to a disk, an inclination angle at which we view this structure, and some additional asymmetry, such as a transparent to opaque midplane, which might be an extension of the accretion disk, more emission from the near or far side, as well as going from a disk to a cone. For the, the dynamics right now, we only consider the gravity of the black hole, as well as near circular inflowing and outflowing orbits around the black hole. So what happens when we actually apply this fairly simple model to real reverberation mapping data? Here are results for five AGNs for the broad H beta emission line, which is the line most typically used. And these, this data comes from the LIC AGN monitoring project, or LAMP 2008 data set. So here I'm showing you the inferred broadline region geometry for each of these five AGN, and this is just one example that's been drawn from the posterior PDF. So here in the left-hand column is an edge-on view of this geometry, where the observer is looking from the right-hand side of the screen, and the size of the points corresponds to how much emission is coming from each point particle. Then in the right-hand side, you can see the face-on view of the same geometry. So a couple of things are immediately apparent. First of all, the H-beta emitting broadline region geometry is a close to face on thick disk. And we also find preference for more emission from the far side of the broadline region in the three objects that we can actually constrain this parameter for. Sorry, these three. Um, the dynamics, then, are a combination of inflowing and near circular orbits. And when we take all of these constraints on broadline region structure, in the end, we can measure the black hole mass to between 0.15 to 0.3 dux uncertainty. So this is a substantial improvement over the 0.4 dux uncertainty we would otherwise have to have if we were to use an average value of the f factor. So overall, I think these results suggest that this is a, a fairly good approach to trying to um, measure the mass of supermassive black holes. Um, the only problem is that it requires very high quality reverberation mapping data. And unfortunately, reverberation mapping data in general has only been done for about 60 AGN. And this forms the basis of a lot of our you know, other AGN black hole mass measurements that are applied to much larger samples of objects. And the way we can do that is through a correlation between the broadline region size and the AGN luminosity. Um, and this means that we can actually, given the reverberation map sample, um, measure a black hole mass in an AGN using a single spectrum. But unfortunately, of course, the single epoch recipes are dependent on the reverberation map sample, so they have the same uncertainties, which means that the largest source of uncertainty is still the unknown structure for the broadline region. So my hope is that we can use the broadline region modeling approach I just described to improve the situation in general for AGM black hole mass measurements in three different ways. The first way is to test luminosity dependence on broadline region structure so that when we calibrate these single epoch recipes on low luminosity, low redshift AGN, and then apply them to high redshift luminous quasars, we're not making some perhaps bad assumptions. The second thing we can do is try to measure an average value of F that is independent of the M sigma relation, simply by combining our different independent estimates for the F factor. And finally, we can see whether F is correlated with any perhaps more easily measured properties of either the broadline region or the AGN. So far, the strongest correlations we've found are between the F factor and the inclination angle and opening angle of the broadline region. But we'll continue to look and see if we can, for example, figure out any way that something more easily measured could correlate with, say, the broadline region inclination angle. 
So in conclusion, broadline region modeling of reverberation mapping data allows us to measure AGM black hole masses more precisely than we were able to do before, and it also allows us to constrain this hidden structure of the broadline region. And that was it. So thank you. Uh, yes, so this is all in the optical, what I showed you. Um, ideally, you'd actually have some information from the UV as well, because the true you know, ionizing photons that are doing the work here are not in the optical. And so, but we have to use the optical because that's easier to observe in the majority of cases. So is this going to improve with LHST? Um, no, okay. So for the work that I'm doing, where we need really high quality reverberation mapping data, really the only way to do that is with a dedicated reverberation mapping campaign, because you're looking at these objects for multiple months with hopefully pretty good high quality spectroscopy as well. So. Yes, um, you just reflect a certain fraction of the continuum, and uh, I wonder if you thought of hooking this up with Fowley to see if you get the right actual uh, line strength. <coughs> Yes, that is actually something I would love to do in the next couple of years. So I think that is sort of the obvious um, extension of this. Really, I've only focused on trying to reproduce the distribution of broadline emission, not the distribution of gas. But in order to connect those two, you'd have to make some sort of assumptions about the photoionization physics. Any other questions? If not, well, that's my time. <laughs>